the altered mental status. And I'm going to try to give you all a couple different ways to approach it, depending on your style and how you like to think. Um, so some are a little bit more practical, focusing on vital signs and physical exam. Um, and then I have kind of just a list of uh, a, a, and a mnemonic that you can try to memorize all the different things that can cause altered mental status. And then I also have a diagram where it's kind of stepwise um, to to try to figure out what could be going wrong. So uh, this is week one. And, and for those of you, if you forgot, my name is Scott and I'm in Salt Lake City at the University of Utah. All right, so today's lecture, we're gonna do the approach. Then we're gonna do one case. Um, and, and I'm gonna remind you all later, but I kept the slides pretty minimal on the case. Um, so you're really gonna have to ask for some information and then I'll give you that information, but it's not all going to just automatically come up on the slides. Uh, so um, here's a general approach to altered mental status. I really wanna hit this home, but you really have to focus on the vital signs. Um, and I want you to add to your point of the pair, point of care glucose to your vital signs. So every time you walk into a, a room or you go to the bedside and the patient's altered, I want you to immediately review the vital signs and make sure that including in that is a point of care glucose. Um, because if they are hypoglycemic, that's a really quick thing you can find out about and change. Um, but the reason I want you to focus on the vital signs, because it immediately starts to give you clues as to what could be going on. Uh, so if they're hypoxic, that could be why they're altered. Just from hypoxia, you become you can become altered, but they may also have uh, concomitant elevated CO2. So they may also not be ventilating well and their carbon dioxide level is where it has gone up. So if you see someone who's hypoxic, consider that this could also be a CO2 problem. If a patient is hypotensive, now you're thinking about all of the shock states. So your differential is really, is there a shock state going on, whether it's hemorrhagic from trauma, uh, hypovolemic from diarrhea or vomiting, um, you know, cardiogenic shock from heart failure, from a heart attack, uh, or obstructive shock from, you know, pulmonary embolism or cardiac tamponade uh, or pneumothorax. So if you see hypotension, um, what's more important than just the altered mental status is thinking what could be causing the shock state and thus causing poor perfusion to the brain, which is actually what's causing this altered mental status. Then thinking about hypo or hyperthermia, so low temperature or high temperature, both of these can present with sepsis. And in fact, uh, on my last shift, I had a patient who was septic, uh, but their temperature was 93 degrees, so uh, about probably 35 degrees Celsius. Um, and they were actually septic. Uh, they were inside. It wasn't because they're out in the cold. So think about high or low temperature. Think about is there an environmental cause is, if they're have a temperature abnormality, or is there a toxicological cause? Um, and then think about their respiratory rate. Their respiratory rate could be a sign of acidosis, and patients who are severely acidotic will be altered. And the reason they're breathing fast is because they're trying to compensate for that acidosis. They're trying to blow off their CO2. Um, and or, uh, elevated respiratory rate can also just be a sign of sepsis. Um, especially in the elderly, they often won't get that high temperature or low temperature that tips you off to an infection, but they might be breathing rapidly despite having clear lung sounds. And that could be a sign of sepsis, an early sign of sepsis. And then look at their heart rates. Is it low? Is it high? Uh, and that could clue you, clue you in and what could be going on. So once you've moved on past the vital signs, let's assume all the vital signs are normal, including a, a blood glucose that you obtained. Um, here are some other big picture questions to ask yourself. So um, make sure you keep a broad differential and don't don't uh, hone in on one thing too soon. And in fact, altered mental status is the broadest differential diagnosis of any patient in the emergency department. Because if you think about it, all illnesses, almost all illnesses, as they progress, will eventually lead to altered mental status. Think about the, the blocks in the past. So I know in my block in January, I focused mostly on abdominal pain and all of, the, all of the abdominal pain diagnoses we talked about, whether it was appendicitis, whether it was cholecystitis, uh, cholangitis, um, all of these things as they progress will eventually lead to altered mental status. Um, so really have to think of a broad differential. 
some big questions to ask though, because I know this can be overwhelming. Um, here's some things that you can ask pretty quickly and answer pretty quickly. And if these things are present, they should prompt immediate action. So is the patient in shock? So that's pretty easy. Look at the vital signs. What is the blood glucose? That's pretty easy. Get a point of care blood glucose. Is there a focal deficit? So make sure you're making the patients move both arms, moving both legs, uh, make them smile for you. Look for facial asymmetry. Make sure that their sensation's normal. Look at their pupils and make sure that they're equal. And if you see anything that, that is a focal deficit, you have to be considering something inside the brain, whether it's an infection in the brain, a stroke within the brain, a hemorrhage within the brain, or some kind of tumor or mass inside the brain. But if there's a focal deficit, then it has to be coming from the brain, not a more systemic problem. It has to be more focal to the to this uh, central nervous system. Um, do they have evidence of trauma? So palpate their entire scalp. I really want you touching every part of their scalp, every part of their face, including their neck, because if they have a C-spine injury um, in their, and they, or they hurt their carotid or vascular arteries in their neck, that could also lead to altered mental status. Um, and then look for signs of that. Did they have a seizure? So did they bite their tongue? Um, did they have urinary incontinence? Um, did witnesses at the scene say they saw him, them, he or she convulsing? And obtain a lactate. Um, seizures are the, really the only thing that I can think of that will have an elevated lactate that will quickly return to normal. So if you get a lactate, it's an elevated, you know, let's say five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then you get a repeat and now it's all of a sudden one. Um, that's probably because they had a seizure and that's what quickly it, it got, you know, high, the seizure's over and now the lactate comes down. Um, so for those of the, you who like lists, there is this mnemonic. Uh, I'm not a big fan of mnemonics, so I can never remember what each letter stands for. Uh, but this is can be pretty helpful and you won't probably miss things if you memorize this. So it's A-E-E-I-O-U tips. So for us, it's all the vowels, all the vowels in the English language and then tips. Um, and so it stands for alcohol, which could be either intoxication or withdrawal, either one can cause altered mental status. It's endocrine um, or electrolytes. So hence the two E's. So is it a, a thyroid issue? Is it a glucose issue? Um, electrolytes, so hypo or hypernatremia, hypo or hypercalcemia. Those are the electrol big electrolytes. Um, and then the second E, encephalopathy. This is a little bit of a diagnosis of exclusion. So if you've ruled out everything else and they came in hypertensive, then maybe they have a hypertensive encephalopathy um, or possibly a hepatic encephalopathy. And you can send an ammonia level uh, if you if they have a history of liver failure. Um, infection is the eye. So that's pretty broad, but any type of infection can cause um, altered mental status, especially in the elderly. Think about urinary tract infections. The O is for overdose. So we're talking about opioids. Um, think about prescription or non-prescription medications like Tylenol, uh, acetaminophen, aspirin is a big one um, that people can overdose on that can make them very altered. Uh, uremia. Um, I also had a recent patient. I don't see this a lot, but I had a recent patient who was really altered. And the only thing that I found wrong with them was that they had acute uh, renal failure. Their creatinine was eight and a month ago it was normal and their BUN was 80 and everything else about the patient, all the labs were normal except for that. And so the diagnosis for that patient was uremia. Um, and this would be an indication usually for uh, immediate dialysis if they're becoming altered because of their renal failure. Um, trauma, look again for signs of trauma, <clears throat> ischemia. So think about obviously strokes, um, but also cardiac ischemia. So um, patients could be having a heart attack, be in a, a shock state because their heart is no longer functioning and, and get poor perfusion to their brain. Um, I would add to this uh, aortic dissection, which obviously is not ischemia um, initially, but if the dissection uh, ends up occluding an artery that heads to the brain, um, then it can lead to an altered mental status. So think about a uh, dissection flap that's blocking the blood flow to the brain as a potential cause of altered mental status. Um, and then pulmonary. So this is hypoxia or hypercarbia. Um, they also add poisoning and psychosis. 
Um, I kind of put the poisoning up with the overdose, whether it was an accidental or purposeful overdose, I would consider that poisoning. So, and then the last one is seizures. So this one's tricky too. They could be post ictal, which I think all of us are pretty familiar with, but they could also be having subclinical seizures. So uh, a seizure that's causing the altered mental status, but not the all the convulsions that we're used to seeing. So consider that they could just be in subclinical status epilepticus. Um, any questions about any of that? So the, the mnemonic again is AEE IOU tips. Um, sometimes it's useful to memorize this to give yourself a kind of a base of how to approach altered mental status. For those who like diagrams, um, here is a big diagram. Um, it starts here is like you have a patient who's altered and are they able to protect their airway? And they're saying, if no, then you should intubate. Um, although I would, before intubating, I would always check this box actually. So I would, I would actually go in reverse because if they have a hypoglycemia, you could reverse that hypoglycemia faster than you could intubate them. So change the, you know, address the blood glucose. Similarly, if they're hypoxic and that's why they're altered, you could probably put them on a non-rebreather and get their oxygen level up and again, get them no longer altered. So now they're protecting their airway. You could probably do that faster than you could intubate them. Um, furthermore, you don't want to be intubating someone who has bad um, vital signs without trying to address them first because you want to optimize your patient's condition before um, intubating. Uh, so moving down, uh, the vital sign abnormalities, we kind of talked about a lot of these things. Um, but if, you, if you're seeing uh, an arrhythmia, get an EKG, hypotension, consider fluids, or if it's a trauma setting, maybe blood, hypoxia, give oxygen. If they're cold, warm them. If they're hot, cool them. Pretty straightforward stuff. For hypoglycemia, uh, the most common way to, to fix that is to give D5W. Um, so this is an AMP. This is in, in America, at least in our code cart. So it's in our, our crash cart. So um, it's really easy to get a hold of a, an amp of D50 uh, and you push it as fast as you can. Um, and you can give, uh, you know, you could start with one, but I wouldn't hesitate to give a second one um, if the patient's gl glucose is, is around the 20 range. Uh, so the history and physical exam moving on, if you see evidence of a toxidrome, like pinpoint pupils, um, or if they're, they're sweating and they're tachycardic and you're thinking, this could be anticholinergic, you know, so look, think about toxidromes. There's just some simple ways to, to fix them. If it's an opioid overdose, give naloxone. Um, I would only give naloxone though, just a quick pearl. I would only give naloxone if they had respiratory depression, if they were altered, but their respiratory rate was normal and they're breathing just fine. I would probably not give it. Um, because if they're breathing fine, they're not going to get in any trouble as far as they're, they're not gonna have any lasting, uh, deficits because of their opioid overdose. But if you give it to them and they go into withdrawal, then you're gonna have a really angry, upset patient who is causing a scene in your department. So I would only give naloxone if their respiratory rates changed. Um, treat alcohol intoxication with vitamins and fluids and alcohol withdrawal, you know, start a benzodiazepine or phenobarb. This is the chart continued. So this arrow here, it just goes down to here. Again, this is within the physical exam, but the physical exam is huge for altered mental status, but you're looking for signs of trauma. Um, and of, of course, getting imaging uh, as you see this, as, as you see the trauma, evidence of infection, you know, crackles on, on their lungs or a stiff neck. Uh, if you're seeing signs of cellulitis, signs of an abscess. So definitely do a really good skin exam to make sure that there's not uh, an infection hidden underneath their shorts. Um, or underneath their shirt. Uh, evidence of a seizure we talked about. Um, history of pulmonary disease. Uh, this really, sh you should be able to diagnose this on your physical exam when you're listening to the lungs. If you're hearing decreased air movement or you're hearing a lot of wheezing or the patient's working hard to breathe with retractions and they're using their neck muscles and their uh, um, nasal uh, is flaring, then order an ABG and look for the CO2. Um, focal neurologic deficit on the physical exam. Again, make sure they move everything, make sure that they are feeling everything normally and get a CT scan if they're not. Um, and then history of a renal insufficiency or failure. If your patient's so altered um, that they're not able to give you a history, uh, one quick thing you can do to, to diagnose like, oh, maybe they're on dialysis is just to look at their arms 
and see if they have a, a fistula there, a dialysis catheter. Um, I've I've seen this happen in my emergency department where they were so altered I couldn't get a history, but I was able to at least figure out that they have a history of renal failure because I found their dialysis catheter. Um, and then if you don't know what's going on, this is the time for a broad workup. Get all the get all the labs, get urine, get EKGs, um, get CT scans, TSH, blood gases, um, and then consider lumbar puncture uh, if you're concerned for possible meningitis. And then almost all these altered mental status patients are going to be admitted um, unless they return to baseline and have a really good um, family who can support them at home, just because they're going to be at risk for, even if you get them back to baseline, they're going to be at risk for uh, returning to how they were being altered after they go home. Uh, so to get a little bit more specifics on some of the diagnostic workup, so if you've gotten to this point, nothing on your physical exam is really helpful, um, and you're just kind of ordering stuff now, uh, the results can help you. So obviously, the, glu the glucose is an easy one we talked about. And then the CMP can be pretty helpful, as it may clue you into an elevated anion gap. Uh, so look at the bicarb as well. And if the bicarb's low, uh, you can assume this is a metabolic acidosis. Uh, and I think most of us are pretty good at considering the causes of metabolic acidosis, get a blood gas to see what the pH is um, and then move there to try to try to fix the acidosis. Um, look for sodium issues. So either low sodium, high sodium, be careful in either direction about overcorrecting um, and consider that the reason that they're either low or high is just because they're volume depleted. So you don't have to give hypertonic saline. If someone has a low sodium, you could actually just give normal saline at first. Uh, and that will still bring them towards uh, normal. Also consider how fast did the sodium change? So um, here in America, we have a fair amount of alcoholics who come in who their sodiums are always low. They live with a sodium of around like 126, 127. Um, and so if they come in and now their sodium is 122, 120 even, I don't usually think it's the cause of their uh, acute mental status because this is actually not far off their baseline. And the reason you get altered mental status is only when you have an acute change, a fast change in the sodium. Is as the sodium quickly drops, it changes the osmosis. So the fluid in your brain shifts um, and you can get edema um, or attraction of the opposite if, if the sodium goes high really fast. Um, and that's the reason you also don't want to overcorrect. Um, if you overcorrect, you could uh, have a huge fluid um, change and actually cause more harm than good. So the goal is to uh, increase by only four mill equivalents in the emergency department and only 10 in 24 hours. And this is the same if they're too high uh, to try to lower it slowly. Um, on the CMP, you're also going to get a calcium and a high calcium can be a cause of confusion. They usually will have some other symptoms besides just confusion, but um, abdominal pain, nausea, constipation, uh, they often will end up with renal failure as a cause of the calcium. Uh, they get renal stones at a high rate. Sometimes they they have a history of cancer or they have a history of bone pain. And that's, that's the reason the calcium is so high. And to correct this, they just need IV fluids and they'll get better. On the CMP, you're also going to get a creatinine and BUN. Again, that would tip you into a uremic encephalopathy. If those are super elevated and everything else is normal and they may need dialysis if that's the reason for their altered mental status. Um, moving forward, if you, again, you don't know what's going on, you could get an ammonia level, and this could help you diagnose hepatic encephalopathy, although it can be misleading. And sometimes the ammonia level is normal, and this could still be their diagnosis. Uh, and sometimes the ammonia level is high, but uh, they're actually, their mental status is normal. So the ammonia level can be misleading. Just be careful when you order it. Um, that it's not as accurate as the rest of our labs. The, the TSH, um, if it's high or low, could clue you into a hypothyroidism, you know, mixed edema coma type state or a thyroid storm. Um, your CO2 on your on the blood gas will clue you into maybe this is COPD or late stage asthma. Um, or in the case of an overdose, if they have a decreased respiratory rate from opioids overdose, that could actually lead to an elevation um, in CO2 and cause mental status issues. Um, when you get a tox screen, if you again, if you don't know what's going on, get a tox screen, send aspirin, send Tylenol, 
<laughs> um, and treat them um, if they're elevated. I would have a low threshold moving forward to get a CT head or a CTA head and neck. Um, I would get this CTA anytime I saw a focal deficit um, because this could be an arterial issue. Uh, and so if you're seeing a focal deficit, then I would just go ahead and get the CTA of the head and neck. Um, if there is no focal deficit, then a non-contrast CT would be fine. So again, if they're just confused, but there's no focal deficit, they're moving everything, pupils are normal, I think a non-contrasted CT is, is would get you the information you needed. But if they're not moving an arm or a limb um, or their face is asymmetric when they smile, then I would get the CTA so you can look for signs of a stroke. Um, and the CTA is going to include you into a lot of stuff. So you'll see epidural or subdural hematomas. You'll see subarachnoid hemorrhages, hemorrhagic strokes, masses, and tumors. Um, and in, in all of these cases, these patients are at risk for an elevated ICP. So the intracranial pressure could be elevated. And so if you just as kind of a, a forewarning for anything neuro-related to these things, all these hemorrhages and hematomas and masses, is that they could be at risk for impending herniation if they're now in an having an altered mental state from one of these things. It may be because they're herniating. So these are just some basic stuff that you can do. You should really do this for all your patients anyways, most of these things, but elevate the head of their bed, control their pain, control their agitation, you want to maintain an adequate blood pressure. So if they're hypotensive, you need to raise it because our the intracranial pressure is the difference between our mean arterial pressure and the cerebral perfusion pressure. Uh, and so if their blood pressure is really low systemically, then we know that their blood pressure uh, in their brain is also going to be low. And that's, um, that's going to be bad. So you need to have an adequate map. So you might need to actually start blood uh, pressors to keep a map of like the 80 range. Normally we just want to keep a, the mean arterial pressure around 60, 65, but in these above diagnoses, we really want to map closer to 80. Um, get their glucose as normal as you possibly can. Um, get their end tidal normal or slightly below normal. So 35 is a good goal. Um, consider the need for a C collar. I, this is a pet peeve of mine uh, in the trauma bay. Patients come in with a big head injury um, and we find out that they have a intracranial hemorrhage from trauma and then they have a C collar on and the C collar on super tight. And what we actually are doing is we're slowing the blood flow in their neck. So the C collar is slowing the vein, the, ven the venous drainage from the brain. So these C collars are actually causing more harm sometimes than good. Um, so consider, do they have a C collar on because they're in a trauma? And if so, can we loosen it or... If the C spine is not injured, then can we just take it off? Uh, reverse anticoagulation of present, that's a whole other lecture in of itself. Um, but pay attention to that. Do a good history, get coagulation factors, um, get their hemoglobin above 10, um, which again, this normally our, our recommendations are not to keep it above 10. But if you're worried that their, their ICP is elevated and they could herniate soon, having a higher hemoglobin can help reduce that risk. Consider giving hypertonic saline or mannitol, and then seizure prophylaxis um, can be important as well. And then lastly, the last thing, your diagnostic workup, uh, again, you want to do a really good physical exam uh, and look for signs that could suggest a specific infection. So undress the patient, look everywhere on their skin for signs of infection, get a urinalysis, consider if you need a lumbar puncture, consider if this could be a, a pulmonary issue and get a chest x-ray. Or if their abdomen's tender, get a CT abdomen. Because remember, again, a lot of the things in the abdomen as they progress can lead to altered mental status, specifically cholangitis, cholecystitis, uh, even appendicitis or diverticulitis. If the patients are really sick from it, they can get altered. Um, so I know that was kind of a, a hodgepodge, um, large approach to altered mental status. So I want to take a moment. Does anyone have any questions about altered mental status, or has anyone had any interesting cases where they ended up with a diagnosis that they weren't expecting? I know I have had some.
No question. I'll, I'll, go ahead. Were you going to say something? Um, so I, I remember two cases that were pretty interesting for me. Um, one was probably a few months ago now, but it actually was the only case of hypothyroidism that I've seen. So a mixed edema coma. Um, they came in cold. Their temperature was low. They came in bradycardic and they came in hypotensive and really altered. Um, and everything we did, like we we ordered a CT of the head, which was normal. We got blood work, which was mostly normal. Uh, we couldn't find any signs of infection. You know, there was no sign of meningitis, um, but because he was cold and had a low heart rate, we were also like, this could be a thyroid issue. Um, and we actually read in his chart that he's supposed to be taking levothyroxine or thyroid replacement. Um, and we're like, well, if he, maybe if he stopped taking it, he could be getting sick. And so we sent off a thyroid level. And of course, um, the TSH was super high and his T4 or his thyroid level was super, super low. Uh, he ended up going to the ICU and they actually treated it, but they gave him thyroid um, level thyroxine and he got better. So that was a pretty interesting one. Um, and then just on my last shift, I kind of mentioned this, but I had a patient who had everything wrong with him. He was cold. His glucose was 22. His sodium was 125. Um, our CT scanner actually hilariously was broken. So we couldn't get a CT of his head, but I was suspicious that he had hit his head. He had trauma on the back of his head. And so there could have been like something inside of his brain. Um, but we actually ended up having to transfer him because our CT scanner broke. Um, so we sent him off to another hospital, but he had a lot of stuff wrong with him. Um, and we tried to correct all of them that we could in the emergency room and, and got him home or got him, uh, sorry, to the next hospital. But that's another one is, uh, if you find one cause consider that there could be more than one thing going on, but sometimes, a patient who's hypoglycemic, uh, they're that way because they were actually septic and they, now they haven't eaten in days. Um, and so their glucose is dropping. So it, there could be multiple things going on at once. Uh, and you never know how long has a patient been altered and kind of what has led to what. So really keep a broad differential, get a lot of blood work. This is one of the altered mental status is one of the um, chief complaints that really warrants a big workup. Um, and don't take any shortcuts. Uh, just only small question. Yeah. For uh, uh, in my in your department, uh, follow you the most common cause of enter mental status. What is that? What is the common cause? What's the most common cause? Yeah, in your mm. department. Oh. Hmm. That's a good, I, I would say probably, I don't know for sure, but I would say it's either sepsis. Um, so they're actually, they're just altered because they're sick, uh, or they're, I think post ictal. So they were had a recent seizure, um, and they come in really confused. I think that's pretty common. I would say those two things. And then maybe trauma would be a third cause. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then also DKA, so diabetic ketoacidosis. We have a lot of patients who are diabetic here who come in glucose super high. They're really acidotic, you know, a pH of like 7.0 and a glucose of 600. Uh, and they can get pretty confused as well. Um, not, you know, not not obtunded to the point that they need to be intubated. Occasionally that happens, but just, just like a little bit altered. Um, I would say that's pretty common too. So, and that one's easy to get clued into. If you get into that habit of every time I see someone who's a little bit altered, immediately getting that glucose, I see that at 600, I'm immediately like, hmm, this is probably DKA. And that's why they're altered. Um, and then I get that blood gas and start the treatment right away. All right. Um, so it is time for a case. We just have one case today. Um, so not too, too bad. Um, if there's any volunteers... That would be much appreciated. And again, for this case, it's there's not a ton of information um, on the slides. It's going to be a little bit more. You have to ask for things, and then I'll then I'll tell you. I, I'm not going to hide anything from you if you ask. I'll give it to you right away. But uh, I'm going to make you ask, and it's not just going to pop up on the screen.
Dr. Dai, if you're still there, um, if you want to grab me a volunteer. I think that uh, some somebody in the class will answer the question. It's easier. Which way is easier? More people, more easier. Oh, okay, I'm fine with that, but. Then you guys are gonna to have to you're gonna to have to ask questions as a group because uh, like I said it's pretty the slides there's not a lot going on all right so here we go um so you've got a 21 year old female she comes into the emergency department after she fell and hit her head and she's got a laceration right above her eyebrow what do you want to do. vital sign so yeah the vital is a great place to start um so your heart rate's 120 blood pressure 120 over 75 respiratory rate of 25 99 percent on room air 38.1 celsius she weighs 70 kilos what do you want to do now you can your your kind of options are ordering tests doing an exam, getting more history, or uh, sending her home. It's up to you. Uh, because she had the uh, heart rate a bit, a bit, uh, tachycardia and had the uh, had, um, hemorrhage 38, I will order the IV and give uh, maybe paracetamol for the review of temperature and then okay. ask about the history. I need more information. I like it. Yeah. So get a couple of things going uh, and then get some more history. Yeah. So, so what do you want to know? What kind of, what kind of history questions would you ask? Uh, what what happened to her before he phone, she phone any seizure or so she said that she was alone at home um she remembers she was having a headache she had just gotten up uh in the it was the morning time just had had breakfast she had a headache she said she wasn't feeling quite normal just kind of feeling a little bit off and she tripped and fell forward, hit her head on the, the side of a of some furniture. She doesn't think she lost consciousness and she was alone. Um, so she doesn't think that she had a seizure because like she said, she's pretty sure she didn't lose consciousness. And then she came right here because uh, she was bleeding a lot from that laceration. Yeah, the first time she had that uh, many times in the past. No, she said she's never she's never fallen before. She's never hit her head. Um, she said it's pretty unusual for her to get headaches. That's an, uh, the headache is a kind of a new thing. Did she have any any symptom like a pee, uh, vomit, diarrhea, coughing? Uh, no cough. No vomiting, a little, no she's a little nauseous, but no vomiting, no diarrhea. Mm -hmm. In case I not remember the, how, uh, the time of onset, or she said no she, symptom. Um, she had a headache when she woke up this morning and then when uh -huh. she had, she had breakfast and then after breakfast, uh, she had just gotten up and that's when she fell. So maybe she had a headache for like an hour or so, and then fell, hit her head, and and then came straight to the emergency room because she's she's bleeding from that cut. How about the past history? Any dizzy? Um, she's normal. Uh, she's normally healthy. She takes no medications. Um, she doesn't smoke or drink. No allergies. Mm. She goes to college. Um, 
she lives she lives on on the college campus so she's she was getting ready to go to school okay is the own information i need to ask and now i i i need to examine how about the, the order you can ask my friend <laughs> yeah any more questions to help me <laughs> anyone else have any questions about uh related to her history or review of systems or anything like that or and, and then otherwise we can do the physical exam um, and then this is just a quick she's just she appears a little unwell but she's not in distress and she's just laying on the stretcher with her eyes closed when you when you walked into the room but she opens that she opens her eyes when you talk to her So the primary survey and physical exam is the next next thing to talk about. Is there anything specifically you're going to look for? Uh, so her is is kind of intact. So I think I want to uh looking specifically for the uh disability. It is there some uh, uh, uh neurologic uh, deficit? Um. So you do a neurologic exam. Uh, and she's able to move. She's able to move her hands and legs. Uh, she is a little bit confused. Um, kind of when you ask her to do things, she's a little bit slow to respond to them. But she she eventually listens. Uh, her pupils were normal on both sides. Um, she does look sweaty, so she's got some some sweat coming down her face, as well as the blood from the laceration. Anything else? Uh, as far as the neuro exam, you were specifically wanting to look for? No more to me. You're cutting out a little bit, but I think you asked for the abdominal exam. Is that right? Yeah, so her, her belly is soft, uh, non- non-tender belly uh, not distended so the belly is totally normal um and the chest as well she's breathing a little bit faster than normal but she's got clear lung sounds uh, no crackles no wheezing normal lungs the first thing Google can i can hear her glucose was 105. Good mm -hmm. that you asked. I thought about making it really low, but uh, in this case, in this case, it's normal, normal glucose. Mm -hmm. And no other other side of the the every bruising. She just has the the cut and like a little bit of bruising on her on her forehead. That's the only trauma um, that you see on her face. Um, if you palpate the rest of her body, um, there's no pain to her extremities, her chest, her abdomen, but when you press on her neck, she says that when you press on her neck, it hurts. So to summarize what we have so far is uh, we've got the vital signs with a, a little bit of a fever and an elevated heart rate. We've got um, a lady who had a headache and then fell. So the headache was there before she fell. And now she's got a cut, she's bleeding, she's sweating, and she has neck pain. And otherwise, the chest was normal. The abdomen was normal. 
uh, and her arms and legs are normal without any focal deficits. So that's, if you did it like kind of by a primary survey, like airway, breathing, circulation, disability, um, environment. So her airway's fine, breathing's fine, circulation's fine. Disability, she's like a GCS 13, 14, because her eyes were closed initially and she's a little bit confused. Um, and then uh, there's no obvious exposure issues. Um, So what what is uh what do you guys want to do next? Apply the C collar and do the CPE on the head and neck. Okay, perfect. I think that's super. And get, get the get the blood test. Perfect. Okay. So we kind of did the HPI. Medical history was normal. Surgical history normal no medications. She's a healthy 21 year old, no allergies. We did the physical exam. Um, so we can talk about the differential um, and the diagnostic steps. And um, as we talked about altered mental status, sometimes you don't know what's going on. Um, and so you, you do a big, you do a big workup. Other times you might be able to figure it out and you can be more focused. So in this case, um, if you see, if you feel like I, you know, I'm not quite sure what's going on, then just do a broad workup, um, and, and be willing to continue to think about it. So get the workup and then readjust your differential. But if someone has like specific things they're worried about, um, uh, we could talk about it now. If there's specific things that you think could be going on. Okay, so um, the diagnosis. Yep, go ahead. Coma. Yeah. Infection. Perfect. Yeah, infection definitely. She has a little bit of a fever, mm -hmm. and a heart rate's mm -hmm. high. Uh, younger lady with the uh, the hyperthyroid. Yeah, I think you could send a TSH. That's an easy test than the thyroid studies. And then obviously trauma, you, you, you've you mentioned the, you saw the cut and you want to get the head CT. So you're thinking about trauma. Is there a bleed uh, inside her brain? So um, I think I'm going to, I want to list some differential diagnosis that I had at this point. Uh, meningitis is one. She has a headache, a fever. And she says that she wasn't quite feeling herself. And then when you palpated, she did have some neck pain. Nobody asked about neck stiffness. Um, but if you had asked, if you did ask about neck stiffness, she would say, yeah, my neck is kind of stiff. Um, so you're thinking about epidural hematoma, subdural hematoma. This could just be a migraine headache. You know, it doesn't have to be something dangerous. Uh, viral illness, given the fever and the headache, maybe she's coming down with influenza. Um, and the, the fact that she fell is just, you know, completely unrelated. Uh, she could have a concussion. Um, she is young, you know, sometimes the young patients, young female patients, if you have no idea why they're have this brand new headache and altered mental status, uh, a venous thrombosis or cerebral sinus thrombosis, depending on how you like to call it could be going on. Um, but yeah, so let's, let's get, uh, we ordered some blood work. Your blood work comes back. Uh, I'll interpret it for you because I know you all can do this easily, but the white count is really the only thing that's abnormal. Um, she's got a leukocytosis or so white count's 14.6. Otherwise, things are pretty much normal. <clears throat> um, here's the head CT. The head CT looked totally normal. Um, you know, there's no issues here. There's no blood. Um, the ventricles are normal in size. Uh, there's no midline shift. So that looks normal. Uh, you don't have the bone window here, but there's no skull fracture either. Um, you couldn't tell on this CT, but, and then the, when I was going over ranking this case, I thought maybe someone would want a chest X-ray just because her respiratory rate was high. She was breathing 25 per minute. 
she did have an elevated heart rate and she had a fever. So you could think like, oh, maybe there's something in her lungs. And so um, in case you wanted a chest X-ray, I threw one in here. A chest X-ray is normal, totally normal. Um, so uh, what other tests do you want that we haven't gotten so far? Or what do you want to do next? May lumbar puncture because we suspect a gut meningitis. Yeah, perfect. Um, perfect, perfect. So you do a lumbar puncture. Um, the appearance is cloudy. The protein's two seventy five, which is way above normal. White blood cell counts fifteen hundred. Those are mostly neutrophils. Uh, the red blood cells are a little bit high as well, and the glucose is thirty, uh, which is low. So what's your diagnosis? And what do you want to do next? Actually, I'm running like this. Perfect. Yeah. And that's it's important to recognize that it's not just meningitis, it's it's bacterial meningitis, um, which is really dangerous. Uh viral meningitis is most people recover on their own, but bacterial meningitis. Huge, huge deal. Very people get really, really sick. Um, and so <clears throat> here's your diagnosis. It's bacterial meningitis. Critical actions are things that I really I, I wanted uh, you to hone in is at a consider a broad differential. Um, you know, this could be any type of infection because of the fever. This could have been any kind of trauma to the brain because she did hit her head. Um, this could have been something, you know, whether it was an electrolyte or metabolic. Um, thyroid related, as someone mentioned. Um, but then ultimately things are coming back pretty normal and she did have a headache, fever and neck pain. So we have to consider meningitis. Um, you obviously needed to perform a lumbar puncture to get the diagnosis. And then this is something to think about afterwards, but bacterial meningitis is very contagious. So you need to initiate droplet precautions to keep yourself safe. So you need to be wearing gown, gloves, uh, a, a N95 mask, and then you need to notify the patient's family. You know, if she lives with family, they need to know that they could be at risk for this. Um, anyone she lives with at college would be at risk for getting this meningitis um, and they need they may need treatment. So um, that's part of our job is to make sure that we don't let this spread. Um, and then obviously you need to admit this patient. Uh, so to go into a little bit deeper into meningitis and in this case, um, this case was a little bit tricky in that she had this fall that ultimately uh, there was no actually major damage from the fall. She got a little laceration with some blood, um, but that was supposed to try to kind of get your focus away from the fever, away from the fact that she actually woke up with a headache. Um, and I was trying to get y'all to get stuck focusing on the trauma. Um, and then uh, you really had to take a good history get a good review of systems, do a good physical exam and realize that she had neck stiffness and neck pain and that the headache started before the fall. Um, and then again, the vitals, the vitals here really should include you in that there was something infectious possibly going on, fever, tachycardia, and an increased respiratory rate. Um, and then this is a, just a point here on lumbar punctures and CT scans. So classically, it's, it's taught that you should always get a head CT before the lumbar puncture in case that there's a mass or a bleed. Um, if you did the lumbar puncture, you could cause more harm. You could actually cause a herniation. As, the, as you remove the CSF during the lumbar puncture, the pressure from that, that uh, column lowers. And if there was a lot of pressure inside the brain, uh, the brain will actually go towards the area of less pressure, which is towards the spinal column and it causes a herniation. Um, and so in this case, if you had asked for a lumbar puncture before the head CT, that could have been a dangerous thing, especially in a head, uh, someone who had trauma. And if she did have a brain bleed from that trauma, um, that lumbar puncture could kill her. Um, and so you'd actually just, you would get the head CT, you'd see the brain, you still have the concern for uh, meningitis, but you would just start antibiotics empirically uh, so just start antibiotics right away, and then you would contact neurology or neurosurgery and help them weigh in um, whether or not they would want to do the lumbar puncture at a later time. Um, so 
some more uh, teaching points. So bacterial meningitis, it's usually caused by strep pneumo, uh, Neisseria meningitis, uh, or Listeria monocytogenes. Um, the Listeria specifically in the really young, so infants in the first four weeks, less than a month old, or the elderly. And I, I read a couple of spots that the elderly was actually just people over 50 years old. So you don't have to be very old for Listeria to start to kind of make a comeback or, or be a potential cause. And if you're concerned for Listeria, you just have to add ampicillin, which we'll talk about antibiotics more in a second. Um, but risk factors, crowded environments. So patients who live in college dorms or they've joined the military and they all live together. Prisons, um, extremes of age. So really young, really old, immunocompromised. And then the cause of meningitis is often actually recent sinusitis. So a, sin inf a sinus infection that's able to go across the blood brain barrier uh, and get into the CNS. Um, a history of VP shunt or cancer. If it's bacterial meningitis, the onset's usually really fast. Patients come in fast. They've only been sick for maybe a day. If they've been sick for four or five days, um, think that this is probably more likely a viral meningitis. But if they got sick fast, like our patient, she woke up with a headache, with a fever, and then she was getting worse pretty quickly, then think about bacterial meningitis. <clears throat> Classically, there's this triad, uh, which is fever, um, neck rigidity or neck pain, and altered mental status. But it's only present in about 50% of cases, so a lot of people aren't going to have this triad. You can also see headaches. Uh, low GCS, nausea, vomiting, photophobia, or seizures. Um, so always consider someone who has a new onset seizure without a history of epilepsy. Maybe they have an infection that caused the seizure. Um, and then the classic physical exam findings that I know I had to memorize, um, and maybe you all had to memorize too, they're really not very useful. So like the whole, like, if you bend their neck, their knees should move. And if you raise their legs, their neck should move. Um, they're, they have like a sensitivity of like five or 10%. Um, these classic findings came from the first studies ever on meningitis, which was before they even used antibiotics um, for meningitis because they didn't have antibiotics. So these studies that that are, are classic are, are really, really outdated. And I wouldn't rely on these tests um, for you to rule out meningitis. I really, it's not even worth your time to do these in the emergency department. Um, one test that you could try doing, and I would only use it um, to try to rule out meningitis if you didn't have a high suspicion. So if you had someone who had a headache, but they otherwise look pretty good, and you're not really thinking meningitis is that high on your list of things to rule out, do this jolt accentuation test. And if it's normal, you could probably feel good it's not meningitis. But if you have a high suspicion, like in this case, someone who has neck pain and a headache and a fever... I wouldn't use this test um, because even if it's negative, I think you should be doing a lumbar puncture, but it's an easy test. It's fast. All you do is you just take your patient's head and you just shake it back and forth for about five seconds. And if their headache gets acutely worse, that's a positive test. And so it's not very specific. As you can tell, if you do that to yourself, you're probably going to get a headache. So you can't really use it to say this is meningitis. Um, but if it's negative, you can feel um, a lot better that maybe it's not meningitis. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, so the diagnosis, <clears throat> this is a big one. If a patient's really sick and meningitis is, is high on your list, you think that that's what's going on, don't delay antibiotics. The lumbar puncture, unlike blood tests and urinalysis, won't be ruined by the antibiotics. So the cell count, the protein, the glucose will not be changed at all by the antibiotics. The gram stain will not be changed by the antibiotics. The only thing that would be changed is the culture. And studies have shown that as long as you do the lumbar puncture in about an hour to two hours after antibiotics, even the culture won't be affected by the antibiotics. So don't be afraid to have the nurse start the antibiotics as you're doing the lumbar puncture if you're really concerned that this could be going on. Because the faster you get the antibiotics, the better the patient's going to do. 
And if you'd have to delay the antibiotics to get a CT scan and a lumbar puncture, that could be hours later until all those things are done and back, the results are back. And at that point, um, you just took a sort of sick patient who's now really sick. Um, and CT head, like I said, classically, we want to get a CT scan before the lumbar puncture. <clears throat> but if all these things are false, you could actually probably skip the CT scan. So if you have a young patient who has a normal immune system and they have no history of CNS disease, you, no evidence of papilledema, they have no focal deficit, no seizures, they're awake, they're alert, they're oriented, and they're able to complete a neurologic exam, if all those things are true, the chance of them having a brain occupying lesion, like a mass or a bleed, is almost zero. So you don't have to get the CT head, and you could just go ahead and do a lumbar puncture. But if you're ever on the fence, if it, the CT head shouldn't take very long to get, uh, and just take a quick scan and make sure there's no huge bleed or tumor. Um, so the diagnosis, obviously, we have to get a lumbar puncture. Uh, the opening pressure is ideal um, if you can get it, um, but it's not absolutely necessary, but it is ideal. So put the patient on their side. If they're sitting upright, you can't get an accurate lumbar puncture because the spinal column then is, is going against gravity. And so it's going gonna, it's gonna to show the opening pressure is super high, right? If they're sitting upright, the spinal column is compressing down on the spot of your lumbar puncture and the opening pressure is going to be elevated. So they need to be on their side if you're going to check. And then for bacterial meningitis, you want to look for low glucose, elevated protein, elevated cell count, specifically with neutrophils. And the way that I remember this um, in my brain is I think about the bacteria. They need glucose to eat. And so they eat up all the glucose and the glucose gets low. The bacteria causes a lot of inflammation. And so a lot of protein leaks into the CNS. And then obviously, if there's a lot of bacteria, there is a lot of white blood cells. And so that's how I remember it um, is for the bacterial meningitis. And then the viruses, um, they will have usually pretty near normal glucose, pretty near normal protein, and only a mildly elevated cell count. <clears throat> um, so treatment, if it's bacterial, we want to use ceftriaxone, and we do want to use a larger dose than normal. So we use two grams because we need the higher dose to penetrate uh, the CNS, to penetrate that blood-brain barrier. We want to give vancomycin to, to cover for strep. Um, and then there's that rare case of staph. And then again, ampicillin, but only if there's these things present. So they're they're older, older than 50, less than one month old, or they're immunocompromised. Um, dexamethasone can be useful. Um, it's mostly useful only if it's Neisseria meningitis that's causing the um, meningitis, but we usually won't find out what bacteria exactly is causing it until way later. And so if you're concerned, just give the dexamethasone early. Um, and ideally, you actually give it before the antibiotics. Because once you give the antibiotics, there's actually an inflammatory cascade um, that goes on inside the CNS system. And so if you give the dexamethasone, it reduces that inf inflammation. So you want to give the dexamethasone first. There's not a lot of downside to the dexamethasone. So if you're thinking that this could be a meningitis, just go ahead and give it. And just to kind of hit all that home, this is an ideal world. This is not always going to happen. But if someone comes in and you're like, this is meningitis, they got the head pain, they've got the neck stiffness, they have the fever, <clears throat> they're altered um, and they live in a dorm room. Um, so I think that, you know, I think this is meningitis. This is what you would do. You'd get IV access, you'd get blood cultures, you'd give the dexamethasone right away. You'd order the antibiotics, but you wouldn't start them um, because in the meantime, you're going to get a CT scan immediately, perform a lumbar puncture. And then as you're doing the lumbar puncture, you'd start the antibiotics. Um, and if there for some reason was any delay, in doing step two, so the CT scanner is broken or the CT scanners, uh, the trauma patients in there or the stroke patients in there, then don't wait for the CT scan. Just give the antibiotics first. A single dose of antibiotics is not gonna hurt a patient who is febrile. Um, anyways, you know, likely they have something bacterial going on. So 
give the antibiotics. And then by the time it's time to give more antibiotics, you'll have clinched the diagnosis. Um, and if they don't end up having meningitis, then you don't give more antibiotics and you really haven't caused much harm. Um, and then <clears throat> all these other things would result like at a later time. So that's would be kind of an ideal world if you could do it perfectly. Um, and then, then, oh yeah, again, treat close contacts, contact their family, um, anyone who lives with them um, and make sure that they're getting treated for meningitis um, with prophylaxis. And you can look up the, the treatment for that, but it's usually rifampin is what we give. Um, so quick overview, just to hit these points home, keep a broad differential, quickly assess for vital signs and really think about what could be causing these vital sign abnormalities. Obtain a glucose. Remember your glucose is one of your vital signs in altered mental status. You really need to get that glucose early. Um, do a physical exam. It's super important. Look for trauma. Uh, look for signs of seizures. Look for focal deficits. Look for neck stiffness. Uh, your physical exam is more important than ever because these patients are altered and you can't rely on them to give you a good story. Um, consider naloxone. Um, I don't think you all have as much opioids as we do here, uh, but for us, this is important. It's so embarrassing to intubate a patient <clears throat> when all you had to do was give them naloxone and then send them home. It's the easiest, best um, antidote that we have in medicine. They can go from death's door to walking out of the emergency department with a smile in minutes um, if you get this diagnosis and give them naloxone. So, and there's there's not no side effects of naloxone, but there's it's pretty safe to give to anyone. Um, just make sure you're only giving it if they have that respiratory depression. Um, otherwise, you're just going to have an angry patient who's in uh, withdrawal from opioids. Um, <clears throat> get a big workup. Think about infectious stuff. Think about the weird metabolic stuff that you normally don't think about. Um, and then it's pretty much you're going to get a head CT. Unless you find out for sure what the cause is, up here. If you end up down here and you still don't know what's going on, get the CT scan. It's going to help you. Um, and, and sometimes gives you the answer. Um, and then lastly, don't delay antibiotics if considering meningitis. Um, and so that's everything I've got for you all today. Um, thank you a lot. Any questions or comments? All right. Thank you. Yeah, Good. you all have a Thank wonderful you. day. <laughs> I will see you guys next week. Um, yes. Same time. Yes. All right. Please. Thank you, everybody. See ya. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. See you next week.